I'm very excited today. Um, I am here with Stephen Thomas, a podiatrist, and he'll tell us exactly what that means, what it encompasses, how he got to being a podiatrist. Um, but before we begin, Stephen, you were telling me about your love for music and guitar addiction. Yeah. So can we start from that? Yeah, okay. Which one should we do? So or maybe we maybe we can even we'll start from that and then slide into how does one become go from becoming a guitar playing addict to a podiatrist? <laughs> Let's start with the music. Okay. Um all right. So yeah, music music is something that I've I've always loved, you know, as a as a kid. And my dad was into music. He loved music. Actually, my dad was in a band as well when he was a teenager in Cardiff. And uh, that kind of spread on through to me. You know, we used to listen to lots of great musicians in the car, you know, just singing along. And so I always loved music. Um, and then at one time when I was a teenager, I just thought, you know, I really felt this like strong urge to want to learn to play guitar. Um, and yeah, and it just, I just, as soon as I had a guitar, I just couldn't stop putting it down. I used to love it. I used to go to school and then I come home, couldn't wait to get home to play the guitar. You know, I'd be playing in the evenings, uh, teaching myself how to play, listening to like Eric Clapton and, you know, some of the big, the big players out there and, um, Mark Knopfler, you know, people like that. And you still play? Uh, not as much anymore, <laughs> but, but I still love to play. And it doesn't take me long, you know, because, we, you know, I don't know if you play, when you're playing guitar, you get kind of get like these buildup of callus and stuff on your fingertips. So I find that that does soften a bit. So if I start playing, say if I play tonight, I'll be fine. But then tomorrow is probably be a bit sore. Um, but you need to keep that regular playing up to get that build up of the callus so you can. But they have alternatives, no? To to uh to not getting the calluses like you can use different uh, objects what are they called the uh the little oh, triangle oh sorry yeah so so on the yeah if so if you're like a right-handed player you you can use a plectrum right so that's on, on your right hand but the, it's where you're putting down the left hand you're pushing the strings down on the guitar neck mm. and and if you like you're playing electric guitar and you're bending the strings that type of thing so it's then, that it's that hand then that will be yeah, sore tomorrow if you yeah, play tonight. definitely that's the one very very yeah, interesting yeah. very interesting so you're a podiatrist which means that you really you you deal with anything that's on the foot and ankle yes yeah. um and how did we get there how did you start how did you choose that career oh man so there's a there's like a you know, you could do like a short, short version, a long version of this. Right? We, we have time. <laughs> um, well, I guess, well, yeah, it's a, it's a long pathway, but you know, when I was, when I was growing up, so I'll go back to when I was growing up, I was, you know, I, the academia was never really too encouraged or, you know, I wasn't too immersed in that type of environment. <laughs> Um, this, the high school I went to was quite, quite a, quite a rough school, really. You know, I was, I'd say I was probably one of the posher kids in school, <laughs> but, but the, the, the thing that made me the posh one was the, I had both parents that lived at home with me, you know, and it was like quite, it was quite a, you know, most of my friends came like single parents and things like that. Um, so growing up, you kind of like thought, well, being a doctor, being a lawyer, being a, you know, something like this, you think that's just, that's not even worth even considering. All right. But, you know, through, and then did, so when I got to high school, I, I couldn't wait to finish and I just love music. So I wanted to keep playing music. All right. And then I, then reality hits, you need to earn some money. Right. So, so I work in a, in like an, an admin job. Um, you know, it's a, it's a decent job. Um, but I, re I knew this wasn't for me. Yeah, and so it was a bit of a bit of a long journey through to podiatry. You know, there's there's things like um, so one of the things actually with uh, the uh, admin job, I used to work with um, underwriting, right? So like people have put through their their life assurance applications, and they would like underwrite them, the risk factor, right? So you'd read about people's like health things. So I used to work closely with the medical underwriters, and I used to find that really fascinating part of the work. Um, so, so that's, I suppose that's where I really started to see an interest in healthcare, 
in a way and in, in the, like the health aspect of things. Um, but then I started to do like music on the side. I built up my own little small recording studio. So I started to like, it's, it was for myself primarily, but I used to record bands and local artists in the area. And I used to love doing that. That's but, fun. Yeah. But as, as, as you may know, it, it, that type of industry is, it's not that regular and you can't really predict like how many, how many people are going to want to record and how frequent. So I needed another backup plan. So I, I set up the small little, um, food business and I set this up with my dad. So we used to have these, like, it was really cool. It was fun. We have like locally produced, uh, jams, chutneys, biscuits, and things like that in Wales. And then we'd go. So all this was in Cardiff. Yeah, this is in Cardiff. Yeah. So also school you grew up in Cardiff. Yeah. So I grew up in Cardiff. Yeah. Yeah. I should have got that out there in the beginning. So I, yeah, I raised in, in Cardiff. Um, yeah, so we, we used to supply all the independent stores, you know, around South Wales and, and then migrated to like North Wales. We used to do that for a bit. Um, so I, that, I think that's where I got a bit of like, I understood some of like the business aspect of things. Um, and then the pathway after that is, it's quite an interesting pathway. So then I end up, I, I realized I needed to change. I needed to do something new and do something for myself, be on my own, really challenge myself, put myself out there. So one day I go to Paris on holiday. And as soon as I arrive, I'm thinking to myself, this is so nice. I could imagine myself living here. It's just got something about it. I felt like, it felt like a, almost a home to me. All right. And then- Do you speak French? Very little. <laughs> yeah, very little. I didn't speak any when I went there. And then yeah. I learned a bit and now I'm back. You kind of forget quickly, you know? You do forget, but, but if some, if I have some friends talking, I do start to pick it back pick up. Pick it up. Yeah. So what is it about France? Yeah. Why, uh, why did you feel that way? You think? Well, I don't, I don't really know. I don't know. I just, the vibe, just the, like the, the fashion, the style I thought was cool. I loved how the weather was just a little bit nicer than the UK. Um, and it's a beautiful city, you know, walking around, it's beautiful buildings, beautiful everything yeah. so much so much to and so much like so many things going on i never lived in a capital city right so i'd never been to like london properly before just to visit for a day maybe but to be immersed in that it was it was amazing um so yeah i come back so i come back and then i think to myself actually what's stopping me from going over why don't i try moving there for just like three months or so see what it's like you know, so that's, that, that was, became my plan. So I saved up and then eventually went out there for like, initially just thought three months. And then I thought, okay, another three months, you know, and I kept extending it and extending it. So I was there for like over a year or less, less than two years. Yeah. Wow. And, and was that experience, uh, monumental on your pathway yeah, to, uh, was, podiatry? It, in a, in a way, in a way it was, it's it, I mean, that part, I was thinking about this earlier. And I think that's the part in my life where I went from being somebody that might have been, you know, quite a little bit more shy. And then when I got to Paris, I was meeting so many people out there, you know, just in the circle of friends of people. And then I started to work in like a tourist center and I was meeting people from all over the world every day. And I used to just love it. I used to love talking to people, you know, just getting to know them, getting to find out why they're here, what they're doing. You know, I found that really fascinating. And, you know, they say that's kind of an aspect of like extroversion, you know, so if you're a bit extroverted, you'll, you'll love meeting people and talking to people and it, and it kind of energizes you. So that's when I realized that, that I really like that. So I was thinking about that, that that is that aspect that I like with podiatry and with healthcare, because it, are you meeting people all day long, you know, and it's not just, it's not just like, oh, a trainee, you need to pretend or you need to say these certain things to make people think that you're interested in them, right? It's, it's like, I have, I genuinely am interested in finding out about people because it's, it's almost like you're, by doing that, you're, you're seeing a little bit of reality, you know, and you, and you find that with somebody else and you see a bit of their reality, you know, the real deep stuff, you know, and in, and before you know it, you're creating this map of, of what, maybe what the real world is, you know? So there's something about that I really like, 
and when I was in, and then just skipping forward quickly, um, in clinic, when I first started doing, um, when I was studying podiatry, I'd be in the clinics and, you know, we're not getting paid as students, right? So we're treating patients. And then, but afterwards, after the clinic, I'd be going back home and I feel like so fulfilled. And I'm thinking, what's going on here? Because I'm, I'm not earning any money, right? I'm not doing this for the money. And I feel so fulfilled. What is it? There's something about it. And I think it's about like meeting the people and making a difference in people's lives. Because you are solving problems, right? Like most yeah. people, you're meeting people in intimate uh, situations. Um, and most of them are coming to you with problems, I'm assuming. Yeah. And most of those problems you could probably do something about. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I think that's what's most fulfilling about this. I was making some notes earlier today and <clears throat> I think that's probably the most fulfilling thing about it. You know, people come in when you have pain, you have some sort of problem. It's real. That's, you can't ignore it. It's, it's it like, it's a real problem and people come to you, they share that problem with you and then you, try and figure out what's going on. You're trying to understand them as an individual, see exactly what's happening on, on that level. And then you're trying to figure out how to fix it. And then, you know, most of the time you fix it and there's nothing more rewarding than that, really fulfilling. So I'm still wondering though, why podiatry? Just because that is very specific mm. in healthcare, right? Yeah, that's right. So um, coming back, so Paris, I think was a good thing for me where I started to really realized I, I had this passion for getting to know people and things, right? I talk to people and be like, you know, they're from wherever, you know, Romania or Germany or something, you know, and I'd find that fascinating. You know, what was, there's always something you can learn from somebody, you know, there's always something, you know, and, and I found that really interesting because every time I talk to someone, I try and figure out what it is, what is it I can learn from this person. Um, anyway, so coming back, so I, when I came back from Paris, I thought, okay, reality check, I'm back. What do I want to do now? Do I want to continue doing what I've done before? Do I want to do something new? And, and I thought maybe this is the time to do something in healthcare. All right. And then, so the, the switch is when I start to talk with lots of people about it back in Cardiff. Um, and I was talked out of doing medicine actually. So lots of people were telling me, Oh, don't do medicine um, because you have to th think about how many years it takes to train. You have to think of all the night shifts, um, how competitive it is, you know, and so all these things. And they were saying, you know, consider all those things as well. Excuse me. <coughs> um, and then one person said, well, why don't you think about podiatry? They said, I know somebody that's a podiatrist and they have their own practice. And I, and I was looking at them thinking, are they serious? Are they winding me up, you know, dealing with feet all day long? And I thought, and they, they didn't seem to be winding me up, right? So I thought, maybe I should seriously consider this, right? So I thought, can I deal with feet all day long? I think that's the, that was the first hurdle. I thought, can I do this? And I thought, well, why don't I just research it a little bit and see, and see, right? So I started to research it and I thought, actually, this is, the more I researched it, the more I thought this is like ideal. This really is ideal. Yeah. So that's what set everything up. Yeah, that was that was the set everything off. Yeah. Yeah, and and then when I researched it all, there was a number of things that I that I've discovered that, that really attracted me to it. So so one of the things is that with podiatry, it's almost a bit like similar vein to you know like dentistry. It's you know you don't go to medical school and then specialize then afterwards, right? You go into dentistry, you go and you study, study dentistry right from the beginning. Um, and podiatry is the same thing. You know, you go into podiatry and that's what you study. You specialize in that area. Um, I know the US is a bit different, but in the UK, that's that's how it is. But the, the thing that attracted me to it is that podiatry seemed to be far more in, if, in its infancy than dentistry. So I thought that there's a huge potential for huge growth in that 
sector, you know, there's a lot of growth to happen. Like a lot of people don't even know what a podiatrist is. Like I didn't really know, you know, if I had a foot problem, I probably would have just gone to my GP, you know? Um, so it's a lot. Me too. I also did not, I did not know for a very long time that you podiatrist specialized in ankle problems as well. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, so that was one of the things I thought, okay, that's quite interesting. Um, because I'm quite creative with things. I thought, right, I can really maybe start to, you know, have a bit of freedom with promoting this and working in this and, you know, um, so that's one thing. Um, the other thing is that at the time, you know, I was single and I thought, well, I can travel around, you know, all the, at the time, okay, it was before Brexit, but you know, you could travel to all the European countries and you could work in a European country as a podiatrist, they'd recognize the qualification. You could work in the Commonwealth countries like Australia and New Zealand and places like that, some provinces in Canada, you know. So I thought, well, I could always work and travel in different countries as well. That's a nice bit of freedom to have. <clears throat> and then you've got the, if you're just staying in the UK, you know, you can, you've got the NHS you could work in, you could work in privates, maybe a mixture of the two or, you know, just one or the other. So you have a bit of flexibility there as well. So, um, so those things really appeal to me, but then of course, then the foot and ankle is like super complex. It's like really, really complex structure and amazing structure. Do you want to throw in the Leonardo da Vinci uh, quote <laughs> that I've seen you use before? Yeah, so it's true though. It's, it's I, I agree with him, you know, and he's he was around. So what is it? Time. What is the actual quote? So the, I think the quote is the the foot, is it the foot or foot and ankle is um, a masterpiece of engineering and a work of art. Um, and it's, it's like, it's so spot on, you know, even with the mechanics of, you look at like the the mechanics and the scientific papers coming out, you know, we're still learning lots about the foot. And ankle. Aren't most muscles in the body in the foot? Yes. Yeah. Most. Yeah. So most I'm, I'm, you know, I'm on a uh, interesting journey and we've done an episode about um, the whole barefoot um, idea oh, oh, yeah. of walking barefoot, barefoot okay. and, you know, buying minimalist shoes and yeah. things like that. Yeah. The effects of it, why people do it. Um, so I'm, I'm from, you know, on the, on the back burner, I'm always on this, uh, journey where I'm learning, um, about the foot, the feet. Um, I'm learning how to strengthen the feet. I'm learning how to make the feet more flexible. And on that journey, I'm discovering that just by doing some small basic things and maybe changing footwear, I've eliminated all foot pain that I have suffered from wow. most of my life. I played football, soccer for the Americans, um, most of my life. And, you know, every morning I used to wake up with foot pain. It wasn't, it was never, not never. I've had plantar fasciitis, which was pretty rough at times, uh, but generally it was just stiffness, some aches here and there. And as the day, um, goes on, it usually would wear off and go away. Uh -huh. uh, but now I just don't have that. Um, oh. it doesn't really matter what physical activity I do just cause I dedicate a few minutes a day to some exercises and some yeah. stretches. But, um, but in your profession, you can't be short of patients, clients coming in because just in my close circle, I know so many people that have foot pain, yeah. have, yeah. um, foot problems, skin problems on the feet. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, just so many different things. What are the most common things that you see? Like one that you mentioned straight away is plantar fasciitis. It's like biggest heel condition. I see it is that, almost is, every day. Is it an umbrella term for a bunch of different conditions or is it is that the condition? Um, plantar fasciitis is the condition. Yeah, there's there was there's a bit of debate on whether it's, is it an itis, like inflammation, is it an osis, like degeneration and, you know, stuff like that, or an opathy and things like that. But I think... Yeah, it's it's the condition though. Yeah, there's 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 another condition called uh, metatarsalgia, which is more of an umbrella term. So that's pain under the forefoot, the joints in the front of your foot, um, in that region. That's more of an umbrella term, but it's it's like pain in that area. Um, I also well, I also consider uh, plantar heel pain, which is what a lot of people will say for plantar fasciitis. They'll say like, oh, how do you treat plantar heel pain? Um, and I think that's, 
it, it's a it's a good question, but it's I think it's too low resolution for anybody who considers them a foot and ankle specialist. Because because all it says is is plantar heel pain. You have pain under the heel. You know, anyone can tell you they have pain under the heel. So so it's about like what what type of pain is it? You know, it probably is plantar fasciitis, but. Um, but doesn't necessarily have to be. Yeah, exactly. Is it, but what what are maybe some common mistakes that people make on their day to day lives that create these problems? Because so many people have these pains. Yeah, yeah. Um, in general, I think footwear is a big one. Footwear really is a big one. What mistakes do people make? So with footwear. You know, I, at the moment because I you know, I'm working in central London now and. Uh, T like uh, lots of people wear tight shoes, tight fitting shoes, flat shoes with no, like really thin soles, you know, around the city, around there. It's like, you know, so you get all sorts of problems. You'll get rubbing on the sides. They're squashing the toes together. The toes are rubbing and pressing against each other. So you can get, you know, it could aggravate a ingrown toenail. It could develop corn development between the toes. Um, it can give you just general pains and aches under the joints as well from just not having enough cushioning. So, and yeah, footwear is a big one. Um, but not just those shoes, you know, even like trainers, like some people who have, you know, say a classic person who is maybe very overweight, but also has extremely flexible feet and that they're just flattened down super easily. And then they're wearing trainers, which are super soft and flexible, just rolling everywhere, you know, and they come in with like plantar fasciitis, right? And you're like, okay, we need to, we need to stabilize your foot a little bit more, you know, um, at least to, as a start. So it's lots of things like that. I think footwear is so many things you could, you could cover with that. Yeah. And, um, like obviously everyone wears shoes. Um, and it seems like generally people don't ask too many questions or don't ask the right questions when yeah. going to buy a new pair of shoes. Yeah. Um, I, again, I've, I'm on this little journey of learning about feet and I bought a pair of those uh, uh, barefoot shoes, um, the Vivo ones, if you're familiar with. Okay. So, so the whole idea there is um, allowing enough space for the toes. Okay. to really spread out yeah. um, and to have the zero drop between the heel and the toe and the, okay. and the big toe yeah. um, and for the shoe to be flexible. So for, again, you know better than me, but the whole idea from, from what my understanding is for shoes of this kind is to allow the foot while covered and protected to function the way anatomically it was supposed it is supposed to function mm -hmm. and not be restricted so that when people walk around with footwear that restricts them you know all day long around london yeah then over time over the weeks over the months over the years over the decades eventually you'll crack something will go wrong something will start hurting some issue will develop mm -hmm. what are certain things that people can practice um to maybe avoid developing these these uh conditions like uh, is there anything where you know it doesn't matter who walks into your clinic they should hear this huh. foundational instruction um yeah. to hopefully prevent or maintain healthy feet well um you know going back to what you were saying you know with the those shoes i i understand the principle the the idea behind it um it makes it makes sense it's not i think the problem happened with what happened with the the problem with that was there are huge claims made that these types of shoes are the best the ultimate what we should be doing forever and it's better than anything else and i think that's the problem because the claims couldn't be satisfied with when you compare it to other shoes but yeah. i but but how else do you sell a product unless you really market it, right? So I think that that was the problem. I think there's there's definitely a space to be using those types of shoes. I really do. Um, I suppose it, it you need to do it on an individual level. You'd have to, you know, the right individual for the right amount of time for the right thing. And then they right? progress like within progression. 
Um, because like you said, people that believe those marketing strategies dumped mm -hmm. all the footwear that they've been used to wearing their entire lives for decades yeah. and of suddenly wearing something new, trying to uh, replicate the exact same movements and exercises that they used to do with a certain type of footwear and now their feet hurt. Yeah. So it was kind of like, you know, counterproductive, yeah. I think for many people. But, but also that I think that type of shoe might not be bad, good, not be better for everybody. Absolutely. You know? um, so some, you know, traditional shoes would be better for lots of people, you know, and you're looking at, um, I was looking at some data uh, uh, quite a while ago now about the, the different ones, you know, and the, like the new running shoes now, it's like, they're just super, super fast, you know, the well, the vapor flies and things like that for like long distance marathon runners getting the time. Um, but there's also a guy who, was it you telling me this? Somebody was telling me about this guy. I haven't looked it up saying that they've, there's this guy who's got the fastest record of free climbing a mountain or something or a, something like this. And he uses those minimalist shoes that you're talking about. Hmm. And apparently he's got the world record for it. So I'll have to check that out. Yeah, I don't think yeah. that was me. That sounds interesting though. Yeah. Um, but okay, so but let's say footwear, you know, regardless of people are obviously making mistakes, even if it's walking around with a size half too small and it's squishing yeah, your toes. Exactly. Yeah. Um, or buying shoes where obviously your foot doesn't fit in this shoe, but you're wearing this shoe because mm -hmm. of fashion, really, yeah. for many in many instances. I think that's it. I yeah. think I think shoes are chosen for for the aesthetics in most cases. And that's the issue it can be you know you can do that for some cases right if you're if it's your wedding day right if you're going to a nice nice evening out somewhere right so it's it's got to go with it. i know i wore these uh, dress shoes on new year's eve um which i agreed to wear for a few hours um okay. and i'll maybe wear them next new year's eve okay. again <laughs> uh, but they'll sit in my cupboard but what is another maybe like common mistake that people make for example i you know i was an athlete most of my life and no one ever told me to stretch my feet. No one ever showed me foot exercises or toe exercises. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, do, going back to the foot thing, were you saying about general footwear? Yeah, well, not not necessarily footwear, but just a common like so footwear. If we categorize that as a general mistake, usually that people make uh -huh. that. Um, can create foot problems? What is another thing yeah. that sends people to you? Yeah, I think, so if I really quickly go through the foot thing, uh, it's just, you know, simple things like you can put your foot on the ground, you can trace it round on a piece of paper. That'll give you an idea of how wide and how long your foot is, right? And if you put your shoe on top of it, you'll see it's probably getting squashed somewhere. So we usually say, just just check the fitting, check it's wide enough, check you have enough length at the end of the toe. We usually say about a centimeter after the longest toe, um, you have that space and also enough depth in the toe boxes as well so that the toes are not hitting the top of the shoes inside. Um, those things are a quick, simple thing that anybody could do and should do for, for their shoes. I appreciate for some things, you know, fashion things, you're gonna, wear tighter shoes for special occasions that's fine um, but in the in the majority of time just getting the fit right is important and you can go from different brands right so you could get you might like a certain style shoe and maybe one brand is just too tight for you it causes you a bit of pain but if you go to a different brand and you go to, you know another manufacturer maybe they just do a wider fit or something you know that would be ideal yeah, and so exercises, stretches yeah. that the everyday person yeah, stretch. maybe should be doing. Should people be doing exercises yeah, and stretches? It's, it's, well, it's a good question. You know, it's should they be doing it? Should they know what's the evidence? You know, does it mean the lack of evidence means that it doesn't support doing it? You know, but I think yeah, it's good. I think it's good. I mean, even things like yoga and you know, it's it's you feel great afterwards, right? Even if the, there's no science to say it's better right it, yeah if you feel better but specific but, like but you know maybe foot, boring I mean, exercises for the foot that you do not see people going to the gym to do yeah i think for the foot and ankle one of the big things you want to do is stretch the calf muscles out the calves are a, a big one because it's linked to your achilles tendon and the tendon inserts at the back of your heel if you've got a tight calf muscle there's all sorts of other knock-on effects you can have. You can have problems in the Achilles tendon, right? So that's one thing, which is a direct um, 
a direct thing, but also if you have a tight calf muscle, it can cause like the arch to force the arch to flatten down. It can increase the forefoot pressure and things. So calf is really, really such a big thing as far as, far as the foot goes. Um, the other things you can do for the foot then, strengthening exercises, like you were saying, going up and down gradually, up and down on your tiptoes and just trying to strengthen those muscles. Because by doing that, you're, you're using the calf muscle a little bit to get up. And then you're using the flexor tendons under the toes. You're using the posterior tibial tendon, which comes around on the inside of the ankle, on the foot there, in the midfoot. And that, those, those will help kind of lift the arch up. So if you've got a bit of a, like a flattened foot, flattened foot or something like that, those things will help. Yeah. Socks. Socks. Is socks an issue? Socks can be. Yeah, it can be an issue. Generally, we say use a natural fiber socks. So if you use cotton or bamboo, then that's a really good start. Do you want to use high content of cotton or bamboo? Allegedly, bamboo will absorb about twice as much moisture as cotton. Okay, so that's something like I did not know. Um, so when when you buy, you're in the market and you buy cheap socks. Yeah. Um, can we assume that they're probably not high in um, cotton or bamboo? Mm -hmm. Not always. I think you should just check. They'll come with packs, right? You want to check the packs on the back. Um, if they see what the the not the ingredients, the, yeah, <laughs> you know what it, what it's made out of. Yeah, but the um and but the the moisture absorption that's the main focus. Yeah, so if it has a high con cotton content, like I think it's like eighty seven percent or something like that. Um, um, do they go higher than that? Maybe, but if it has a high cotton content, you'll know that the cotton aspect of it will absorb moisture. But what's the problem if we if if we're not absorbing moisture correctly? Yeah. So the so the moisture aspect is, um, you know, you sweat from your feet. If you've got socks and shoes on, you're going to sweat a bit, right? And then and it keeps it warmer and moist in there for a longer period of time. So you want to get the moisture away from your your foot, so it doesn't get too sweaty. Um, there's a number of reasons for that. Um, foot odor is one of them. And the other one is like athlete's foot, which is such a big one, which I just did a video on. I just made a video on YouTube about. Which which I watched. Athlete's so but, so yeah. what, cause why is it called athlete's foot and what is it exactly? Okay, so athlete's foot. Uh, which is, it does not only affect athletes, right? No, yeah, of course, yeah. So it's, so athlete's foot is, it's it's medically known as tinea pedis. That's technically what it's, what it's uh, called. But the athlete's foot, um, I think it obviously got his name from being very common amongst athletes. And the reason is, is because athletes are, you know, very active, they're running. So there's tons of friction going on in their shoes. There's obviously tons of sweating going on in their shoes as well. You mix the two, the sweating and the friction, and you just sprinkle a tiny bit of fungus in there. And it's like perfect grounds for, for growing fungus. And that's what athlete's foot is, is basically a, a skin infection on the feet and you'll get it mostly between the toes because you know between the toes it doesn't dry out very easily it, it you got lots of friction going on so most people get it in the webbing of their toes that's the early signs yeah and is it um and something like the right sock wear um can fix that or well, mostly prevent it if you have athlete's foot yeah then you'll need to treat it and and i'd recommend treating it as soon as you can yeah, I've never had it, but it's, I've heard it's a very itchy one, so it's hard to miss if you have it, right? Yeah, well, not always. It's, okay. it, it can be itchy. Um, it often is itchy, and that's usually one of the things that people say, right, this isn't right, I need to need to fix it. Sometimes it can just present as dry, scaly skin. So lots of people will look at their foot and say, oh, I have a bit of dry skin here, you know, and they'll they'll say like, I'll get some moisturizer put some moisturizer on and, and it's fine, you know, and it looks, it does look better for a, a day or two, but then you'll find that the fungus will just love the moisture. So if you think of it like simple terms, like mushrooms or something, right? They love really dark, moist areas. So if you feed your dry scaly skin, which is, which the fungus has made dry and you feed it with more moisture, 
it'll look nice for a little bit and then the fungus will be like thanks for that i really like that and then it'll dry it out again yeah so, so you'll never really get to it until you start treating it with anti-fungal creams or products so if i um so you know if i'm wearing the right socks and i'm absorbing um the moisture correctly on my day-to-day activities um then in most cases i should be okay and not suffer from athlete's foot yeah you should be fine yeah yeah you, you'll pick you'll pick it up from contaminated grounds that's where you'll get it from so mm. if you if you share a shower with you know lots of other people at home and it's not cleaned regularly and they so, and somebody, okay, so and hence somebody the, has it hence, hence the athlete's foot because athletes um, or you know guys or, or or girls in a team were probably yeah. sharing the same showers exactly yeah, yeah. but so people with the uh, you said odor smelly feet yes um so a lot of the time it is just maybe wearing the wrong socks it, it can certainly exacerbate it yeah yeah you know there's different like bacteria on you we all have a, like a natural flora a bacteria on our skin um with the foot the uh if you just keep it in a shoe that doesn't breathe very much and then you're sweating a lot and then the moisture can't dry out and it stays moist then lots of these bacteria love sweat and they seem to love sweat more than they do if you just so like if you did an experiment and you put you had a really sweaty foot but then you had somebody else who had a dry foot but you sprayed lots of water on there right the person with the sweat would spread the bacteria a lot faster so it's so it's the some of the nutrients within the sweat in the moisture that the bacteria really like and then it multiplies and it grows and of course then it goes in it also goes in the shoes as well same with athlete's foot so you'll get you get like smelly feet or athlete's foot on the skin but it'll also go in the shoes so some people think I'll oh, just treat the foot treat the foot treat the foot and they forget to treat the shoe so you need to treat the shoe as well so potentially athlete's foot and potentially smelly feet um if we're not absorbing the moisture in the feet correctly exactly. um but any any other conditions that can come out of it out of of not absorbing the moisture correctly uh on your feet not a huge amount there was those are the big ones those okay. are those i see like all the time and are socks important necessary you do have people that no, don't wear yeah. socks yeah um are they important i know obviously in uh, maybe cold places you probably want to wear the socks just because yeah to keep your feet warm um but if you did not have to is it important yeah it's a good question i guess it depends where you where you're living and where you, what you're doing day to day um the you know socks will add like warmth like you say so if it's a cold area or you have things like Raynaud's phenomenon or chillblains which you know where the tips of the toes will just become really cold and those types of people need to be a bit more careful about keeping their toes nice and warm um <clears throat> apart from that i think that the shoes then will act as a barrier so i think that's the next thing that the socks so the socks will act as a barrier so the socks will act a barrier between the shoe between the foot and the shoe yeah so it's so like you know if you're sweating it'll go into the sock mostly and maybe a little bit in the shoe you know but and then when you change wash your socks and change them every day you kind of slowing that like transmission between the foot and the shoe a little bit yeah, yeah. talk to me about some friction as well talk to me about blisters blisters yeah. yeah why do they form um and i i i think i think it's friction Yeah. from my experience yeah. but if you can explain why they form and why some of them are so painful yeah. and others are less painful yeah. and why some of them are bloody and others ah, okay. are not okay so yeah it's so friction is the is the big thing so blisters um you can get blisters going back to the guitar thing right and um Mark Knopfler that's the guy um what what was his song money for nothing and he says maybe get a blister on your finger you can maybe get a blister on your thumb something like yeah, that yeah. he's talking about playing the guitar so so it, but it's it's a friction right you 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 get with guitarists you would get a blister on your thumb if you don't use a plectrum because you're plucking the the strings like that particularly if you're using le- uh, like a steel strings like acoustic guitar electric guitar um uh, maybe not as much and uh, not quite as 
likely if you're playing classical guitar, but it's friction. And this going back to the shoes, you'll have uh, runners will get like definitely like marathon runners, ultra marathon runners, they'll all get like blisters of some sort, but you find that you, the people that are experienced in doing that kind of preempt it. They get used to trying different strategies, you know, maybe putting Vaseline between the toes because that reduces the friction if that's where they get the, the blister, right? Um, some people are to use that second skin stuff. Uh, what was the name of that stuff? Um, yeah, I know. I know the product. We just break, stick it over areas yeah. where you know you're likely to um, exactly. to have a blister. Yeah. So it's but yeah, it's it's friction. So you, you, the friction is annoying the skin, and the the body's way of responding to that is by almost like trying to protect it by producing this fluid bubble, and that fluid bubble is it's like clean fluid. It's not like an infected fluid unless like you've got an infection, right? But it's it's like clean fluid as your body's trying to create a barrier to protect it from all this all this friction. Um, and sometimes you'll get a burst capillary in there. If it's quite a bad blister, you'll get some blood trickling in there and it just looks way better, way worse. Where, yeah, it looks worse, but is it necessarily worse? Uh, not, a, not a huge difference. Um, maybe you just caused a little bit more damage because you've you've gone through and burst some of the capillaries that are, that are mixing with that, but not not hugely so, so a blister left untreated um, mm -hmm. can, and I've experienced this myself, where if you keep, like if you don't stop or put a second skin product or take yeah. any measures to, um, to, to, to heal the blister, it can form some sort of a, like a canyon in your skin, like a deep, do you know what I'm talking about? There's a name for the condition. When, when you've had a blister. When you've had a blister, you're leaving it untreated. So instead yeah. of maybe, mm -hmm. you know, you're wearing a footwear that's causing a blister on your heel. Uh -huh. um, and instead of dumping the footwear or putting a second skin product or uh -huh. something like that, you don't. And you just let it keep rubbing against okay. that area. Okay. It creates some sort of you a... You can create, like a, you can get like ulcerated skin in that area if you did that if you really continually just breaking down the skin and rubbing it you could get a wound like which is technically an ulcer on the foot it could develop to be that bad um, but most cases you would you get the blister depending sometimes you would just leave it depends how painful it is and how big it is where it is sometimes you might just lance it so you just put like a tiny, like, you know, in clinic we do it, um, you just put a sterile blade just to kind of lance it, drain out the fluid. Lots of the pain just comes from the pressure of the fluid with you, with the side of the shoe or the ground, right? That's where most of the pain. So if you just lance it, it takes away most of the pain. But then you need to allow for the skin cells to regenerate. So it's going to take two, three weeks for it to regenerate. Like with, with skin cell turnover, it's about a month. So... With blisters, you wouldn't have damaged the full thickness of the skin, but it's probably going to take, you know, two to three weeks. But blisters should be drained? Not always. It depends how painful it is, how big it is, and where it is, really. But if left untouched, like you have a blister on your in your hand, yeah. and you're somehow able to leave it untouched, let it do its thing. It'll, what? it'll do its thing, yeah, if you left it. And the fluid will just... The fluid will just, the body will just, yeah, yeah. disperse within, yeah. It'll yes, thing. it'll just heal on its own. So interesting. Yeah. Um, nails. Uh -huh. Nails is always an interesting one because yeah. you know, especially when you see, um, you know, you 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 notice people when they have nice feet or not so nice feet, and a big part of that is the nails. Yeah. Um, so why do nails um, change shape, change color, change uh, thickness? Yeah, there's so many different reasons why, what that could be. So, um, so one, okay, thickness, the first thing with thickness, you can get thicker nails from trauma. So if you've dropped something heavy, like at the gym, you dropped the weight on your toe or you, some of my patients, you know, they drop a bottle of wine or something on their foot, um, a, a sudden impact on the toe can cause the nail, the nail roots, the nail matrix to, 
then become almost a bit deformed. And then the nail can suddenly become super thick very quickly and also grow in strange shapes. All right. So that's, that's one thing. The most common way of having a thicker nail is that they gradually and progressively get slightly thicker with repetitive micro trauma. So you, a lot of runners will get this. Um, people that wear slightly too tight shoes, um, just that repetitive banging on the nails, it just stimulates that nail root and it just produces a very, very slightly thicker nail. You don't notice it from month to month, but year to year to year, you know, five years, 10 years of it, your nails then you're noticeably thicker and you can't reverse it. So it's, yeah, it's irreversible. It's almost like a pro protection mechanism, I guess. It's maybe your body's way of saying, your nails aren't stuff tough enough for the trauma it's getting that's producing thicker. Yeah, and the, yeah, there's no way of uh, reversing the. Uh, yeah, you can manage them. You can file them down regularly. You can see a yeah. podiatrist and things that can just keep them down, or you can do them at home with a file if they're not too bad. Yeah. So for all the uh, men out there that their girlfriends uh, tell them to get a uh, a pedicure, or is it a pedicure? Is pedicure? Mm -hmm. Yeah, podiatrist mm -hmm. pedicure. Uh, to get a pedicure once in a while, um, should they be going? Yeah, why not? Yeah, no, it's think, usually I, it's an automatic no from yeah. the boyfriend, <laughs> from the boyfriend's perspective. Yeah, I think you know, I think feet it's just so neglected. I think that's one of the big things, and I think that's why podiatry is in its infancy um, still. Because, because they're hidden in shoes. People will, you know, they want it, they're now taking more care on like teeth and, you know, you take care of your hair and your skin and your eyebrows and your, you know, all these things, your clothes, mm -hmm. things like that. Or you go to the gym to keep in shape, but footwear or foot health, foot health is way down the list and priorities. You know, it'll be, you'll take care of your shoes the way they look more than you will take care of the health of your feet. So, so yeah, if somebody wants to see a pedicurist or a podiatrist, you know, for whatever reason, I think, yeah, go for it. Um, um, a podiatrist, it, yeah, see, see a podiatrist, they can give you a good check over, you know, they can't just treat the nails. They can give you, you know, some tips on things. They can look at them. They can examine your feet and say, oh, do you realize you've got a little bit of hard skin on this part, you're probably overloading this. You know, it can just get a bit worse and worse and worse. So, you know, give you some tips on how to prevent it getting worse. It's worth just doing just a one-off. Still on nails. Uh -huh. um, and I'm sure you see this on the internet because everyone does. There's, there are always Google ads for uh, nail fungus ah, treatments. Yes. Okay, yeah. Why? So why are those ads so, so common? Um, what is nail fungus and <laughs> is it reversible? Well, the, uh, so yeah, going back to thick nails. So uh, as I was saying, so thick nails can be from trauma, like sudden trauma or repetitive micro trauma. The other way is if you've had like a fungal infection of the nails, that can produce, it can make the nail look like it's really thick. And then you often get like this slightly yellow tint, thicker, soft, crumblier type nail with fungal nail infections. Um, so those thick nails would likely become thinner after treatment. Not maybe it may be not be super thin, but it's it it may be the fungal aspect of the infection that's causing the majority of the thickness of the nail. But it is possible yeah. to get the fungal infection out of the nail. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, I've seen lots of products out there, but the, as a podiatrist, the ones we recommend based on like the scientific data, there is, there's three main different ways of doing it. One of them is you use a, a nail lacquer that has 5% amarolfine in them. And you can just paint this on once a week, file it down once a week and just keep applying it. The, this is not the most effective treatment, but it's, it's sort of the least invasive treatment for these nails. So you, you paint it on. I find these types of, this type of treatment is good for one. If you just have a little bit of fungal nail infection just on the surface, um, it can penetrate that. But if the nail is infected through the full thickness and maybe the skin underneath the nail, it's just not going to penetrate it. It's not going to get there. Um, and that's when the other treatments come in. So the other treatment is 
uh, oral medication, which is the most effective. Some people are really against medication if they don't really need it, which is fair enough. Um, the efficacy of the tablets is very good. Um, you take, so the, the norm standard procedure for this is you take a nail clipping for confirmation you, to the lab. You send it off to the lab just to make sure it is it definitely fungal nail. Um, once you have a confirmation of that, you would then standard, you would do like a liver function test, which is a, a simple blood test just to make sure the liver functions fine. You can handle the tablets basically. So if you can, most people can, you're fit and healthy. Then you generally have like a course of this medication. It's like one tablet a day for about, usually about three months. And that usually fixes the issue? Yeah, it'll treat all the nails at the same time. So if you've got like all your nails have infected and you've got athlete's foot, for example, right? This th These tablets will just treat all of it at the same time. You still want to treat your shoes, but but it'll treat all the nails at the same time. Now, treating shoes is putting them through the washing machine good enough? Uh, <laughs> well, I suppose it depends on the shoe, right? You don't want to ruin the shoe. True. Um, you, you can wash out some shoes. You know, I, I've washed in the past some of my trainers in in washing machines. I don't know if I put one in a washing machine now, but like in a bowl of warm soapy water, just to wash them out, just to kind of clean it, make sure it's thoroughly dried. Um, but more, I think what's more effective in the actual treatment, that that would kind of wash out the population or the, um, what would you say? Yeah, the population of the, the fungus in there to reduce it. So you could you could do that as a as a basic thing. If, you, if your shoes are really old, you, you know, you're not, going to buy a, a new pair soon or something. I wouldn't put leather shoes in, you know, in the washing machine, that kind of thing. But if they seem appropriate to be, to be washing, you could, you could do that, make sure they dry it thoroughly. But the treatments for this is, is to use an antifungal spray for your shoes. Okay. That sounds more. Yeah. More so that's efficient. what, I, that's what I would recommend for people to use. Yeah. 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 Spray that down in the shoes, use it every time, maybe every time you take the shoes off, give them a good spray. And then by the time you want to use them again, make sure they've thoroughly dried out and then you're good to go and they're treated shoes ready to go. Just keep doing that for I don't know, a month or something like that. Now, if you have fungus in on one nail, yes. are you at risk of it spreading? Yes, you are. So yeah. that's a risk of not treating an issue that you notice. Yes. Now, if you're someone that has fungal um, you have fungus in all of your nails in your in your feet. Are there any other risks? So if someone's happy with what their feet look like with the fungus in all ten of their toes, are there any other risks? Like, should they be treating it? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you, there's some cases where you wouldn't do it. You know, if somebody's, you know, they're systemically unwell. You know, if they you, they couldn't take the tablet because that type of if you've got all the nails in, infected fully, the only thing that really would be worth considering would be the tablets. Yeah, um, and some people can't tolerate the tablets, so in that case, you would just monitor it, keep them short and filed. You know, doing what you can, making sure that you treat the skin all around the nails. Um, yeah, um, is other the other type of treatment? The third one is to whether you remove the nail. And take it off. You know, so you could. There's, it depends on the severity of the infection. So the, imagine the nail, and you just have a corner of it that has the fungus, right? You could potentially carefully cut or section part part of that nail out. Oof. So, you, so you're cutting out that. You could do that. Sometimes you can do that without any local anesthetic. You know, it depends on the patient and what the nail's like. You could potentially, or you could do it under local anesthetic, just give them a little injection in the toe, make it numb, section back that toenail to, to, to get rid of anything that might have some fungus in there. And then you treat it with, ath so you wanna use athlete's foot cream on the skin underneath that area. And then the new nail growing out should hopefully not get reinfected. Um, in other cases, you can take the full nail out and then you allow a new one to regrow. So sometimes also uh, nails do fall off on their own. 
Um, like I've had in my playing days, a yeah. bloody nail yeah. Yeah. Um, that just, you know, you wait, you can see it over the days, it's like slowly detaching yeah. from the body yeah. and then it just falls off and you're left without a nail, which is a very weird thing to see yeah. um, and experience. Um, yes. Yeah, so why does that happen? Is it, is it infection? Or? And, and then you got, when that happened, a new one did regrow, right? Yeah. 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 I, yeah. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, it, yeah. it did. Um, but also like, it's like a new part of your body is growing. Um, it definitely doesn't look the same as it used to in the past uh, with the original nail. Yeah. Um, so why does that happen? Is it because yeah. I because I I think that it happened. I think someone stepped on me. Yeah. It's, um, it's, so is I it a trauma it, thing? I see it all the time. Yeah, it's a trauma thing. Was it? Yeah. The, the reason I was asking you whether it grew back is because I'm really curious because some people say when you remove the toenails. Like if it's a fungal nail, if you remove it, some people say, oh, you shouldn't do that because the nail won't regrow, right? And you and you read it in some literature saying, you know, or oh, nails might not regrow. I've never seen it. I've never seen it. And I've seen people lose nails. I've never seen it. I've never heard of it. I've never, I've never spoke to anybody that's had it happen to them or known somebody that's happened to. So I think it's extremely rare. That's what I was asking you. I thought if you're one of those people where you've lost a nail and you haven't, hasn't regrown, I'd be really curious. Yeah. Yeah. Cause no. it, cause they're really robust things and nail roots. They, they, they're really good at growing back. Even when you're trying to, when you're doing a nail procedure and you're trying to stop the nail regrowing, it can regrow even with like the best techniques, you know, it can regrow. So they're really tough things. Um, but yeah, going, yeah, going back to your part, sorry, I went on a tangent then, um, going back to your issue, the, yeah, the nail is trauma. You'll, you will traumatize the nail from the nail root. So on the, under the base of the nail, like you won't see this on the, if anyone was watching, but under the base of the nail, so the back end of the nail, um, that's where the nail root is. It's like a, a thin jelly strip, right? So with trauma, you would have banged that nail somehow, whether somebody stamped on your foot or maybe you stubbed your toe, banging the sofa, you know, that type of thing. And then what happens inside, which you can't really see is that the nail will detach from the nail root, but it'll stay in place. It'll just be just detached from it. You won't be able to tell it's, it's really happened. You'll get like bruising, you get pain, you get some swelling, some, you know, that type of thing. And then the nail root will continue growing. So sometimes the nail will just fall off and it looks like there's nothing underneath. And then other times you'll get, you'll bang the nail, it'll stay where it is because it's still stuck down underneath, but it's detached from the nail root. And then the root then will continue producing nail. And then you'll get this kind of overlapping of the nail. So you'll get one nail. Growing top, underneath the other Yeah, the yeah. new nail will grow in underneath it. And eventually that old original nail that you banged will then detach. And, but pa I see that a lot with patients, you know, athletes and yeah. people like that. Yeah. So as a podiatrist, you also uh, fit people in, into orthotics? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And is that a, um, I think it, it's, it's, it's a common thing that people look for, desire um, yes. and use, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Because even me, like, um, you know, I, I have friends, family that, you know, change their orthotics from different shoes, different activities. Um, is, so is that something that you recommend? Well, for everybody, I, I I wouldn't insist that everyone should use them, uh, uh, you know. Uh, because of sorry, because obviously, like you know, the big shoe companies, um, they create orthotics like one size fit all. Huh, yeah. Um, okay. and then so when when someone has foot issues, you examine their foot and you want to create something that's more um, custom to that individual. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Now. I, yeah. By doing so, though, by because again, you know better than me, but I'm just trying to understand and feedback that I've that I've heard or backlash against orthotics mm -hmm. is that by creating another element of comfort for the individual in their foot, you're actually putting to sleep a certain area of the foot, a certain function of the foot, mm -hmm. so that yes, when walking around short term, it'll feel better and feel more comfortable. Mm -hmm. But long term, you're not doing your foot any favors because it's not dealing with the pain. It's not getting stronger. It's not mm -hmm. releasing any inflammation. It's not getting more flexible. And it's not improving its day-to-day -day function without the support of 
some orthotics. Yeah, I can see where you're going. It it's so with with orthotics. I don't personally recommend that everybody uses them. You know, they can be comfortable. They can make you feel comfortable wearing. I use orthotics. I don't really have any major foot problems where I need them, but I use them because I feel a lot more comfortable. If I'm walking long distances, it's a lot more comfortable for me using them. And I use them in my trainers that I'm wearing now, and I use them in my dress shoes as well in work. Um, the argument to whether it makes things weaker there's, there are some papers that say that using orthotics can strengthen some of the tendons. You know, some some of the tendons can become stronger. Um, principally, you know, can it make some things weaker? I don't. I'm not sure. I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced. But it's. I think that's like an area that you kind of have to decide for yourself. Some patients ask me, ask me this: Will it make anything weaker? And I. I don't think it will. I don't think it will. But but then this goes back to the question of why I don't prescribe them for everybody, right? I don't insist that everyone should use them, right? Um, and I think that's because there's a there's almost like this I don't know, like a sacred aspect, you know, to, to everybody. Like you wouldn't say, even if it doesn't cause any harm, you wouldn't insist that everyone must use them. Right, so you have to have that freedom to like live the, your life you want to do it. You know, if you think like your foot's going to do better without them, then you know, you should, don't use them. I went to but, see a physiotherapist once who yeah. he saw that I was wearing orthotics in my uh, trainers, and he pulled them out and he threw them on the floor. Um, I picked <laughs> them up afterwards and kept using them for a little bit. I've stopped <laughs> since, actually, not because yeah. of him, uh, but he told me, uh, and I was seventeen at the time. Yeah, giving. A 17-year-old orthotics is like giving a 17-year-old a walking stick huh. if he doesn't need one. Okay. So that kind of stuck yeah. with me. Well, it kind of bothers me okay. until today. So so, so going back to why I don't prescribe them, so, that, so going back to when I do prescribe them, I generally, most of the time, I only prescribe them for particular problems or to help somebody with a problem they have. I don't just say, you must have them, just even if you have no problems. Sure, if you if they're comfortable and you want them because they feel comfortable, you know, sure, I'll make you some if that's what you really want, uh, and I'll make sure I'm not doing anything that's likely to cause a problem. So there's that aspect of it. But if I make somebody orthotics or I'm prescribing them for somebody, it's for a particular problem, or and to prevent a certain thing not happening or to maximize the chances of it not happening. Um, you know, it could be say like plantar fasciitis, right? So I'll I'll see the individual, what kind of shoes they're wearing, and it's to help with that particular condition. If you overload a particular joint and it's really sore, and you can see that it's the way you walk, you just have super high arch foot and your feet are walking heavily on the outside and you're banging away at the, those joints and they're really sore, it's like, yeah, I can see. You know, I'll do a gait analysis and see that's how they're walking, right? So if they have pain there, I'll make you some orthotics so we can change the function of the foot a bit, offload that particular joint as well, you know, get you walking. So that's, so I tend to intervene if there's a problem. Yeah. That's yep. when I go by. But going back to like the 17 year old thing, it's, I, I don't see any problem giving orthotics to anyone of any, uh, almost any age really, as long as it's there for a reason, right? You, you're doing it because the 17 year old has whatever problem or whatever it is. And you, they're there to help with that particular thing. Yeah. Please tell people where they can find you, um, where they can uh, maybe as an extra resource learn more about this. I know you have a YouTube channel and you have a website. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so uh, the London podiatrist.co.uk is a website, but I'm also on Instagram, um, the London, at the London podiatrist, I think it is. And my YouTube channel is at the London Podiatrist as well. Yeah, so you can find me on there. I'm, I've am i started doing, how much time do we have? Oh, uh, we're, we're wrapping up, but wrapping no, up. Uh, okay. yeah, carry so, on. So the, the YouTube channel is some, it's a new thing I started doing, right? So um, so like I moved to London and, and I started to learn as much as I can. And I kind of got to this level now where I feel I want to share some of this information. Because as a student, I found it hard to find 
real, really good, you know, teaching information online. And I thought this is the time where I need to now try and articulate myself and articulate what's happening with the foot and ankle and just teach people. Put and you said like it's up. still at its infancy. Yeah, it's, and I'm putting this out there. It's all like free access. It's on YouTube. So you can just watch them, you know, and uh, awesome. learn, learn awesome. wherever you can. Ask as many questions. And I'll, I'm trying to make as many videos. So it's nice when people comment on something, they'll say something. And because as a podiatrist, I'm always looking at the technical things or, you know, sometimes you're thinking too difficult. And then somebody like, you know, even you asking me a question about something, it's like, yeah, why don't I just do a video on that? It's so obvious. The people will tell you what they want to know. Yeah, I, you, you ask like a question and I think, yeah, I, I'm always thinking too detailed and too, you know, yeah. too deep. Yeah, we're excited to see uh, more content from you. So thank you very much. Well, thanks for inviting me. It's been, been good fun. Thanks, Danny. If you found this video useful and want to see more like this, make sure you subscribe below and don't forget to hit the notification bell.